Excellent! Hey everyone and welcome back to Paul's Hardware. Today I'm very happy to be bringing you part two of my 4K video. And today's video is all about are we actually ready for 4K right now? Monitors like this ASUS PQ321Q are becoming a little bit more available. This one's still quite expensive, but I'm starting to see some come in at the sub $1,000 price point. But do we actually have the graphics or GPU horsepower to back that up and push that many pixels? So that's what today's video is all about. I have a bunch of benchmarks I want to share with you guys. I want to jump right into that. But first, we need to establish some criteria. What, is that, what exactly does it mean to be ready for 4K? So I have two points that I'm trying to hit. One is 30 frames per second, and we'll call that playable because I know a lot of folks, Steve, I'm looking at you, would not even accept 30 frames per second as a playable frame rate when it comes to PC gaming. And then we have 60 frames per second, which is good, good frame rate. Um, and if we can achieve more than 60 frames per second, it means we can achieve very playable games at 4K resolutions. And hopefully we can even do that with all of the eye candy turned up. To that end, I have a slew of video cards that I've been testing out. We have the Radeon R9 290X, we also have the GTX 780 Ti, and we also have the GTX Titan Black. Some really, really powerful cards, and I'm testing one and two-way configurations with all of those cards. So let's jump into the hardware and see what I'm using for today's tests. The test bed is one you might be familiar with. It's running on an Intel Core i7-4960X at 4.5 GHz. Motherboard is an ASUS Rampage 4 formula. We have 16 gigs of G-Skill Trident X 2400 speed memory. That's 4 by 4 gigs, quad channel. We also have a SanDisk Ultra Plus 256 gig SSD, Rules Will Hercules 1600 watt power supply, and Windows 7 Ultimate 64 bit. And as previously mentioned, testing on the ASUS PQ 321Q 31.5 inch 4K 3840 by 2160 monitor. And I am testing these at 30 hertz just for the purposes of the benchmarks. I know 60 Hertz is available on this monitor, but it needs to do multi-stream transport mode, which means it actually treats it as two separate monitors, and I wanted to remove that from the equation. When you're benchmarking, the refresh rate is less important than the actual frame rate that the graphics cards are able to put out. Moving on to the video cards, I had a decision to make here, and I decided to go with overclocking everything, because that's what I would do if I was trying to run 4K. And also, if you watch part one of this video, I use the Kraken G10s uh, from NZXT to water cool my 290Xs to give them some better performance, since they seem to deal with some throttling issues here and there. But I was able to boost them up to 1550 speed on the memory, as well as about 1155 megahertz on the GPU clock with two cards, and 1175 megahertz on the GPU clock with one card. The Titan Blacks are absolute beasts when it comes to overclocking out of the box, even with the stock cooler. We are actually running at 1,218 megahertz GPU core clock, and I also bumped the memory up to 1850. The GTX 780 Ti's, I was able to overclock just a smidge more. 1219 megahertz on the GPU core clock is what they're running at, and the memory there, again, running at 1850. And now, I think we can actually just dive in and take a look at the benchmarks, and I'll talk you guys through these so we know what's going on. First, we have 3D Mark 2013, the Fire Strike demos, and of course, I start a 4K video with non-4K benchmarks, but anyway, uh, I've added stock Titan Black numbers, not overclocked here, so you get some uh, comparison numbers. These are synthetics, but just look how those overclocked 290X cards actually beat out the GTX Titan Black at stock. Pretty impressive. 3D Mark 11 is next, and uh, I guess I'm a completionist, so I included this as well. Excellent performance showing by the 290Xs here, and this is the beginning of a trend if you're looking at the NVIDIA cards. The overclocked GTX 780 Ti's beat the overclocked Titan Blacks, and this is only when memory isn't a factor, and more on that in just a moment. Next we have Unogen Heaven 4.0. This is actual 4K at 3840 by 2160. It's humbling to run this type of test with this type of hardware. Um, you can see the frame rates are quite low. This is at 8x AA, which again is silly at 4K, but it really does bring the GPUs to its knees and shows just what kind of horsepower you're gonna need to run this resolution with max eye candy. I wanna mention that Heaven 4.0 does not use more than three gigs of VRAM in these tests, which uh, gives you the predictable ordering that you can see here with the results. Unigen Valley 1.0 is next, also running at 4K. And look just how close that 290X is coming to the GTX cards. Valley actually will push past the three gigabytes of VRAM usage, and it's actually at a specific point in the run when the rain starts to fall. And it really chugs on the 780 Ti's with their three gigs of VRAM right there, and it crashed the run with them several times. Hence, you can see the low minimum frames per second with the 780 Ti's 
but these Titan Blacks did pull ahead thanks to their 6 gigs of VRAM. Metro Last Light is next, and this is an actual real game. Excellent. Uh, all of the single card solutions actually hit playable 30 frames per second plus frame rates on this test, and we're still looking to break 60 though. Metro always has low minimum frame rates, and I don't know why. Bioshock Infinite is next, and here I want to point out that the 14 series beta drivers from AMD that I'm using do have some throttling problems still that uh, cropped up pretty bad in the Bioshock Infinite test, so you can see the performance there is not as great, but excellent showing by the NVIDIA cards, easily held over 60 frames per second here. Moving on to Crisis 3, you'll note I added another set of benchmarks because I was wondering what turning down some settings might do, and anti-aliasing is probably the number one choice since it has less impact at 4 Although I want to point out, I did notice an, a difference uh, going from anti-aliasing to non-anti-aliasing. So test take Crisis 3 at 4x AA as well as 0 AA. Got a nice boost from turning off anti-aliasing, but uh, you would still need a two-way configuration with all of these cards in order to hit playable, and that's just because CryEngine is mean, I guess. Far Cry 3 is another game that saw significant throttling with the R1990 X cards, hence the poor performance by those. Also, this is a game that used more than 3GB of VRAM when running at 4K, hence the really low minimum frames per second on the 780 Ti's and the Titan Blacks beating the 780 Ti's in this test. Turning off anti-aliasing also put the two-way NVIDIA cards into the acceptable 60 frames per second range, so nice win there. Battlefield 4 is next. I saved this one for last because it's a popular game for benchmarking, and uh, I am impressed that all of the single cards in these tests hit 30 frames per second or more, all the two-way configurations hit 60 frames per second or more. The 290X cards still trailed the NVIDIA cards in these tests, uh, so I made kind of a last minute decision to do some mantle testing, so we're going to throw that into the mix in the next set of benchmarks. Now quick note here about benchmarking with mantle. Fraps uses DirectX 11, so you can't use Fraps to test mantle. Uh, I used a thing called a Frame Latency Analyzer Calculator, a bit of software that I found. I'll post a link to this in the description if you guys are interested. It's from a Czech website, so Google Translate is your friend. But I use this to parse the frame time logs from Battlefield 4, and it provides a comparable frame rate for comparison. So it adjusts your actual frame rate uh, for things like stuttering and scene variability and gives you a comparable frame rate output. Stuttering was negligible here with the single cards, uh, but two-way configurations of 4K still produce stuttering according to these tests. Mantle definitely makes a difference though, so although it's not as significant as in some systems, some tests you might have seen online that are more CPU bound, it still gave the 290X cards less stuttering and enough of a boost to win out over the NVIDIA cards. So it's hard to say if this is impactful in the bigger picture though when you're talking about Mantle, unless you really, really, really like playing Battlefield 4 and Thief almost exclusively. So now let's do some post-benchmark analysis, and let's start off by talking about VRAM, because I have the 780Ti's with 3GB, the 290X's with 4GB, and the Titan Blacks that have 6GB. Basically, I saw a big improvement going from 3GB to 4GB, since uh, you can definitely go past 3GB with a lot of these tests. So going with something that has 4 or more definitely will lead to a better experience with 4K gaming. Also, why did I choose this particular hardware, these particular cards from AMD and NVIDIA? Well, I wanted to choose the cards that gave the best performance possible uh, from Team Red and Team Green. I also wanted to choose a configuration that was at least somewhat reasonable when it comes to cost. Uh, the three-way and four-way configurations just tend to throw money at the problem. And I know this is still a very expensive uh, solution, but going from a single card to two-way configuration made the most sense to me because that's where you get the biggest boost after three- and four-way cards uh, tend to drop off when it comes to performance a little bit more. There's also quite a few variables that go into testing of this nature, and there's definitely other things I could have done. First off, for the 290X cards uh, with the NZXT Krakens, I could have put some VRM heat sinks on those and actually tried to kind of make some of my own by chopping up some aluminum heat sinks from some old video cards. Decided not to go with those, uh, basically because the 290Xs are loners and I need to bring them back to work, and I would have needed to use some more permanent thermal adhesive on those to get them to stick. Um, so if you are going with that solution, definitely get some VRM, VRM heat sinks because the 290X VRMs were hitting 90 to 95 degrees Celsius, um, even with not extensively long benchmark runs, and uh, long term, you would want to keep those cooled. Also, temperatures I didn't talk about too much, so I guess I can talk about that here. Even with the uh, NVIDIA cards uh, being overclocked and set the temperature target to 90 or 95 degrees Celsius, they were still only hitting 75 to 80. Um, the 290Xs were also only hitting about 45 to 50 with the water cooling, so definitely a lot better cooling performance there and led to some increased overclocking, although the uh, GeForce cards we're overclocking just fine, even with these stock heat sinks. So there's tons of other settings I could have used. I could have 
gone with mid or, or high settings instead of ultra. Uh, I could have gone with various different anti-aliasing or other post-processing effects. Basically, it just comes down to time. I did not have time to test every possible variable, but hopefully the uh, anti-aliasing on and off test gave you guys a little bit better uh, idea. And with any of these tests, you can always take your game, adjust your settings down until you hit a playable frame rate with whatever configuration you happen to be using. Now there was some other hardware I could have used. The one I really would have wanted to have tested out would be the AMD R9 290 because it's a very uh, reasonably priced card compared to these other ones. And definitely could also be a bit more of a budget solution, budget quote unquote, if you're looking for a 4K monitor solution. So hopefully, Maybe we can get some 290s in the future. I, we don't have any 290s at the office right now, so I wasn't able to test those. And then the one other thing that I was really almost gonna do, I just ran out of time and I, I wanted to get this video up this weekend, was uh, when testing the AMD cards, I was using the 14.3 betas. Uh, I could have gone back to the 13.xx, uh, the Wickle certified drivers, which don't seem to have as much throttling issues. Uh, I really just ran out of time there as well, but I tried to point out to you guys when throttling was occurring or at least when it seemed to be affecting the benchmarks a lot. So hopefully that is sufficient there. But uh, again, uh, with the 14 dot whatever drivers, once they are Wickle certified, hopefully that will be cleared up and maybe we can see even a bit more performance out of the, two, out of the 290Xs. And now at last I've rambled long enough. So let's talk verdict. Are we ready for 4K right now? No. Okay, I'll say no if you're adhering to the PC Gamer standard, which is 60 frames per second or higher, and everything turned up to max, all of the eye candy. That's generally what a lot of people like to go for when, it talks, when you're talking about PC gaming and high-end gaming configurations. If you're looking for that, you're really not gonna be able to get it, at least with the AAA titles that are using a lot of graphics horsepower. It's just not there yet. I think we're gonna need to wait till next generation of graphics cards from AMD and Nvidia, and then uh, possible other solutions like um, maybe more mantle support in some games or uh, perhaps other solutions that might somehow give us increased frame rates. Basically hardware, we're looking for increased uh, hardware performance. But I'll say yes, we are ready for 4K gaming. One is if you're okay with 30 hertz, which heck, console gamers use it, that's, that's, that's okay. Two is if you're okay with sacrificing some of the eye candy, some of the post-processing effects, anti-aliasing and that uh, type of thing to bring your frame rate up to an achievable, uh, reasonable amount so that you can turn V-Sync on and play at 60 frames per second or at 30 frames per second. So if you're okay with that, then yeah, you can 4K game right now. Also, I have to point out again, these are expensive configurations, so you need to have some, some cash on hand right now. It's definitely not a budget option, but uh, again, hopefully as uh, hardware is released this year, more monitors, more uh, GPUs from, from the GPU makers, we might see increased performance and more accessibility trickling down. For now, 1080 is still fantastic to play at, so uh, if you don't quite have the scratch to get together a 4K setup, just go for 1080. I think you'll be, you'll be just fine. But lastly, I wanted to point out a quick warning, and that is that if you are going for 4K, check the monitor that you're using because 30 hertz and 60 hertz monitors are both available. There's a lot more 30 hertz ones that are currently out there. If you want 60 hertz natively, it's gotta have DisplayPort 1.2. It's gotta have a video controller that can actually push a 4K signal at 60 hertz rather than what's in the ASUS, for example, that uses two separate controllers and simulates two screens. And uh, definitely DisplayPort 1.2 or HDMI 2.0 once that becomes more widely available. But that's gonna wrap it up for this video, guys. I really hope you've enjoyed it. I spent a lot of time getting all this stuff together, so um, edifying content. I surely hope um, that you guys have learned something and maybe gotten a better idea of whether or not you're ready to jump into 4K right now, or maybe put it off another year. It's up to you. But let me know in the comments what you think, what I could have done differently, what I could have done better. Love to hear that. Of course, leave me some feedback, maybe a thumbs up if you really enjoyed this video, and we'll see you all next time on Paul's Hardware.